Hello class, welcome back to Control Systems Lectures. This is our lec this is the fifth lecture on the modeling in the frequency domain. And in this lecture, we will be looking at the rotational systems. We've covered translational systems, and so now we our focus is on rotational mechanical systems. The variables that we use in the rotational mechanical systems will be the angular displacement which is in radians and then we have the angular velocity in radians per second and then we have angular acceleration in radians per second square then the torque that is applied is in newton meter remember that for the translational system we had x which was a translational displacement and we had the velocity for the translational velocity and acceleration for translational acceleration. So these are the equivalents for the rotational um, mechanical systems. We also chose the reference arrows for both the angular displacement, angular velocity and angular acceleration of the body to be in the same direction. And we know from dynamics that our omega is theta dot and alpha is omega dot, which is also theta double dot. The power that is supplied for rotating body is given as P equals to the torque multiplied by the angular velocity. We look at the various elements uh, in the angular, in the rotational system, just as we had elements in the translational systems. Uh, if we apply the Newton's second law for rotating system, this will be your torque, which is the DDT of J omega where J denotes the moment of inertia and the unit is kilogram meter square. So in translational, in translational um, system, we had the mass, but in rotational systems, we would use moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia of a body whose mass M can be considered to be concentrated at a point you can write your j to be ml square where l is the distance from the point to the axis of rotation but in case that this does not exist if this condition does not hold then you use your parallel axis theorem to find your j by using this equation which we also did in dynamics then for uh, non-relativistic systems that is constant moment of inertia we can easily write that j omega dot is equal to torque or j alpha. A rotating body can also store energy in both kinetic and potential form where this is your equation for the kinetic energy and this is your energy in the potential, uh, the potential energy. Then we look at the friction elements. Again, in the friction elements, there is a relationship which is algebraic uh, between the torque and the relative angular velocity. And this is what we use now to come up with the, um, uh, with, with the relationship between the torque and the viscous, uh, uh, or what we may refer to angular uh, viscous uh, uh, damping. So here you have two elements rotating in two different directions, omega 1 and omega 2. And in between them you have your viscous damper or you can have a system like a bearing where this shaft rotates in this direction and this also rotates in that direction and there's an oil firm uh, between them that gives you the viscous damper. So if the rotational frictional element is assumed to have no inertia, then when a torque T is applied to one side, a torque of equal magnitude but opposite direction must be applied on the other side as well. So you see if we apply a torque on this side, an equal and opposite torque must be applied in the opposite, on the opposite uh, end, but in the opposite direction. And then we have our torque to be equals to the viscous damping coefficient um, multiplied by the change, the difference in the angular velocity. Then we'll look at the stiffness elements, which is spring for the translational. So we also have angular spring. So rotational stiffness is usually associated with a torsional spring 
or with relatively thin shaft so when the shaft is very thin and you apply a torque on the two ends it also have a stringing effect so for a linear torsional spring or flexible shaft the algebraic relationship between uh, the torque this is not tau this is t we're using t in our case and then the angular displacement theta is given as t is equals to the spring constant multiplied by the change in the angular displacements which gives you your spring um, displacement since the moment of inertia for stiffness elements is assumed to be negligible or is represented by a separate element the torques exerted on the two ends of a stiffness element must be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction as shown in this diagram then the potential energy is stored in a twisted stiffness element and can affect the response of the system at later time. So you can see that this is the potential energy stored when the spring is spring loaded, as we say. We now look at the relationship between torque and angular velocity, torque and angular displacement, and the impedances when we've taken the Laplace transform of the various elements so if we take spring for example the relationship between the torque applied on a spring and the spring constant is given by if you i think it's better we start with the displacement is given by the uh, spring constant multiplied by the displacement so this is the torque angular displacement relationship if you now want to look at the torque angular velocity velocity relationship you have to integrate the omega or angular velocity and this gives you your angular displacement so torque will be k integral 0 to t of omega t dt so the impedance in for the angular spring or torsional spring is k then if you look at the relationship in the viscous damper again if you look at the torque angular displacement which is more familiar to us it's d which is now the, um, the viscous damping coefficient d theta dt or this is now your omega so this is given as d omega and you can see that if you take the laplace transform of this you have d s theta and so d s becomes the impedance and if you look at inertia um, you have the moment of inertia j you apply the torque t which then have a displacement theta if you look at the torque angular displacement relationship again which is easier to comprehend you have a j d squared theta over dt and you if you want to get this in, in, instead of displacement in terms of velocity or angular velocity then it's j d omega t dt you can see that d omega t dt is the same as d squared d, uh, d squared theta over dt squared now again if you take the laplace transform of this you will have j s square theta t and so j s square becomes your impedance which is written here so these are your impedances for these elements the spring Torsional spring, viscous damper, and your inertia. So now let's look at an example to put all of this together. So the question is to find the transfer function theta 2 over t of s. So you apply your torque and there is a displacement. Um, the torque is applied on the left side. You can see this is a rod and you have a torque that is applied on the left side of the rod and we have a displacement on the on the right side and we are to find the transfer function theta 2 over t s now if you look at this we have bearings here so there will be viscous damping here so there will be d's on on this side but this is a thin um, rod and this can be um if we write if we if we draw the schematic of of this rod it will look like this so it will have both 
um, a springing effect between the two side where you apply your torque and it will have a damping effect on the ends which is the bearing so we said that for a thin rod that if you apply a torque if you release it it will spring back and then here you have your bearing the damping so here we have the schematic drawing of this system where you have your d1 you have your j1 you have k you have your j2 and you have your d2 you apply your torque on the left side and you have theta 2 which is your output and we're interested in finding the uh, transfer function which is your output over your input all right this will be in block diagram form this will be k over del and i'm going to explain this now in a moment so what we do just as we did in the me translational mechanical systems from the free body diagram we have your j uh, we want to draw the free body diagram of j1 so the first thing and let me before i go on let me explain also that because we have two j's two moments of inertia we, uh, we're going to have two set of equations just like in the translational when we have two masses we have two set of equations in this case we will also have two set of equations so first we have want to formulate the equation for j1 so um talks on j1 we find the talks on these are the talks on j1 if j2 is kept fixed and j1 is rotated so if you look at this j1 uh, j2 is kept fixed and j1 is rotated in the direction of your torque of course and so you will see you have the impact of d1 you have the impact of k and you have the impact of j1 so that gives us um uh, j1 since torque is going the applied torque is going in that direction the 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 um moment of inertia will tend to oppose that same thing with the viscous damper and the spring effect so you have this free body diagram and so if you put this if you now uh, if you now keep um if we now keep j1 fixed and then we rotate j2 then we will only have k theta 2 um maybe again i show you so here we are keeping this fixed and we are rotating j2 and we are looking at the effect on j1 so you can see it's only this spring that will have an effect on j1 so this will be the free body diagram to now get the whole free body diagram on j1 we have to combine the two the two uh, diagrams and you can see this is the combined diagrams your j1 uh, in that direction d1 in that direction and your spring constant in that direction and then when we kept j1 fixed and we turn j2 we had this k2 uh, k in this direction so now we will will sum up this some of forces and some of the sum of forces will be j1 s square plus d1 s plus k you can see they are all with theta 1 so theta 1 of s then minus because k2 is going in the opposite direction k theta 2 of s and this will be equal to the applied torque so we have ts which is the applied torque on this so we have our first equation so this is equation one then next we will do the same for on j2 first you hold j1 fixed and rotate j2 then you indicate the torques on j2 and these are the torques on j2 by holding j1 fixed secondly we hold j2 fixed and rotate j1 then we indicate the torques on j2 so these are the torques on j2 by holding j2 fixed and rotating j1 finally we combine the two diagrams into one to form the free body diagram of j2 and from this combined because this plus this is equals to this uh, if you look at the arrows and the forces um, the, that we have here it will be the same on this side or the torques rather 
uh, forces is for translational. So torques, we have it here. And then now you can formulate your equation from this combined drawing where you have minus k theta 1. So minus k theta 1 because it's going in that opposite direction. And then you have j2 s square plus d2 s plus k and all of this is multiplied by theta 2 of s and since there is no any applied torque on j2 it will be equals to zero so now we have formulated the two equations simultaneous linear equation and now the next thing is how do we find our transfer function so this is equation one and this is equation two i've just written them here for you to see and I wrote them in such a way that you see this is the component with theta 1. And so I brought theta 1 here. And then this is with theta 2. This is theta 2. Um, in this form, we can then put this in the matrix form. And these two equations, we cast them in the matrix form. And because we now have them in the matrix form, we can use Kramer's rule to determine the transfer function. And the transfer function will be given as theta 2 over ts which is equal to k over del and where your del is the determinant of the matrix on the left side of the equation so del would be this portion multiplied by that minus minus k multiplied by minus k and that is your determinant now, in case you've forgotten the Kramer's rule, please go through um, my video where I solve the translational system. I explain the Kramer's rule there. But you can also just go through some uh, videos, YouTube, or some just Google search, and you'll be able to find how the Kramer rule is used because you will need it in formulating your transfer function especially when we have two set of equations. So this is the end of lecture 205. And in the next lecture, we'll be looking at gear systems because gears are rotational systems, rota translational, uh, mechanical rotational systems. So we'll be looking at gear systems.